I didn't point out every lead, but uh, I was trying to point out this correlation between the high lateral and the septal area. But no, you could argue that the V4 has ST elevation too. Yeah, and V3 as well. As well. Yeah, you could argue this whole area. And also, you see that there's no R waves, which is a kind of clue to an old infarct. So he's lost R waves here. And if this guy's a one hour chest pain, he should not have lost his R waves across the precordial leads within an hour of his infarct. So that, that was a clue to the, that he had an old septal, anteroceptal infarct, and now has these new uh, acute changes. Oh, that was kind of a tough case. Unfortunately, this guy has a pretty bad cardiomyopathy. His ejection fraction is only 30, 35%, and he can barely do anything um, because of shortness of breath. I'm hoping after his bypass, he'll, he'll be somewhat better. Um, uh, so this is a patient who's had prior bypass surgery, stenting, and ICD. Uh, so if you look at this EKG, I think what stands out here is so inferior league again, 2, 3, and F, this corner of the 12 league. That's where you're going to see the inferior ST elevation. It doesn't look like there's enough ST elevation in the quarter leads to, to worry us. And then there's a little bit of T wave inversion in 1L. This is a little bit more subtle than some of them. Um, you can see what happened. So he had a clotted stent. These are all stents here. There's a lot of things in here. So sternal wires, you have a pacemaker atrial electrode here, you have a ventricular defibrillator electrode here, and <laughs> you have the, the right core artery that's closed right here. So after PCI, this is how it looked. <laughs> this looks like somebody dropped a toolbox in some of these patients. <laughs> 38-year-old um, man with chest pain. So here, um, and I've forgotten what the EKG the things are going to show afterwards, but I'll, I'll try to figure it out with you all. But uh, so we see 2, 3, and F are, are uh, elevated. So you think about uh, acute inferior, although I'm a little worried about this PR depression down here. I'm wondering if this is acute pericarditis. Uh, it looks like it's fairly diffuse. That's the elevation, 38-year-old chest pain. There is the C if I'm wrong. No, I'm wrong. So this one had a high grade LED lesion here that was stented. So it was a little tricky. So it was diffused because it was high grade. What's that? It was diffused. Yeah, because, because it's it a big distri grade. it's a big it's distribution. A it covers a lot of territory. Mm -hmm. And so it's you know, some of these with global ischemia, you can have a pericarditis night pattern, you can be fooled in a young guy and, and if you you know you're gonna you're gonna be worse off if you call that pericarditis and send them home. If you call it a STEMI and you find out right. you're gonna be better. So Lesson to learn there. So this patient, 56 years old, not doesn't speak English, squeezing some sort of chest pain. First EKG, really not that remarkable. These a uh, little bit of T wave changes out here, but I would say this is a pretty non-specific EKG. Um, I don't, you know, when you look at these EKG leads, you really need to see consecutive complexes with SD elevation. If you see that it's up in the first complex but normal in the second. You, you really should disregard that. In the stress test, we have to see three consecutive complexes with SC depression before we consider it significant. So now, uh, I guess as uh, chest pain got worse, the so second EKG, this shows you the value of that repeat EKG. So now he clearly is evolving an inferior ST elevation infarct and a high lateral uh, uh, ST depression and one in L. And accordingly, it's maybe a little bit of ST depression, but uh, this is the striking thing here. How long between those two 12 Um, uh, Do you remember, Mama? Mm -hmm. I can't remember. How long ago was this PM? It's like a year ago. Oh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> I don't have that. We're working hard at doing those five minute, five yeah, minute, we ten really, to 15 really, minute you know, repeats. We're, we're, because we're, what happens in the ER is they get this kind of an EKG, they go for their chest x ray, and they, you know, and the doc's busy with other things. and. You know, they're kind of having this low-level chest pain the whole time, and then all of a sudden they crump. And you're like, repeat the EKG, oh, okay, this is systemic. And like I said earlier, yeah. sometimes the EKG gets repeated, and they set it on the counter, but they don't go find the doctor because right. they may not be clued in. If the patient's not having much symptoms, right. it Some can be a little subtle with their symptoms. The, you, you, can, you never underestimate how many times you're going to get fooled by these EKGs, mm -hmm. uh, and presentations are always tricky. They're never, they're never the way they should be. Uh, but look at the dramatic, look at the size of this vessel. 
and uh, how that vessel just cut off here and caused that problem. Let's open up here. So really pretty, uh, make a huge difference. Um, so EKG 10, 67 year old male, uh, he left against medical advice uh, before he was supposed to have his bypass. <laughs> so he was already known to have disease, recommended to have bypass, said thanks, but no thanks. I think I'll go home. So he comes back in with chest pain. Uh, this first EKG uh, is remarkable here. I, I think I picked this one because you can see the right bone branch block. So right bone branch block, you get the rabbit ears kind of configuration in the right recording lead. So V1, V2, V3, RSR prime. And uh, you should not see ST elevation here in those leads. Usually there's, if anything, a little ST depression. But, uh, so this is a very success, uh, suggestive of perhaps a septal injury. So V1 have two, two millimeters? Doesn't look very. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, with this one, maybe not, maybe a millimeter, millimeter and a half here. Uh, but I just have to say with the right funnel branch block, it would be unusual to even see that much ele elevation. The reason that the false pauses for uh, the S elevation of V1, V2 are usually the LVHs, the, the left bundles, uh, these people, the early repulls. But when you have a right bone branch block, you should not see any ST elevation there in that lead. So it's kind of an interesting combination. So, uh, and you can see he had a totally occluded left anterior descending artery right here, clotted off. And open it up, you see the extent of that vessel, all the branches. That's a very important vessel. Come on. We must have got that patient really early because that SC elevation had not evolved across the whole chest. Doctor, we're, I'm seeing information about determining baseline from T to P or PR interval. I was told never use the PR interval, but now I see some material. What do you recommend we use to choose our baseline, our, our really isoelectric line? Uh, it's, yeah, it's going to depend a little bit on heart rate and what the neighboring complexes and different leads look like. and. You know, often I'll, I, I'll take a sheet of paper uh, and just lay it down and try to find what I think is the baseline based on the other complexes, just stretch it out there. So and whether it's it. PR interval or T to P, mm -hmm. as long as it's consistent, we can probably base it, we can probably depend on it. Yeah, you, you, can, you can do that. And, and there's, there may be a little guesswork when they don't match up exactly when the, the P to T and the, you know, these other things are not exactly the same. And you get the patient relationship. Yeah, yeah, you know that that's, that's, that's a uh, problem there. <clears throat> oh, those are those are really good points to make. Um, so, 64 year old with epigastric pain, shortness of breath, nausea, hypotension. So, it seems kind of sick. Uh, you know, uh, you probably already know that you know these inferior MIs, the nausea and hypotension is very common when you get an RV infarct. They really need volume. Uh, this would not be a good one, of course, to give nitroglycerin to. You see that patient with inferior injury and low blood pressure. The best thing to do is crank open the saline up and get them really filled up. So this is an acute infraposterior infarct here. Um, and you can see the vessel dominant right coronary is occluded right here. Before the bifurcation of what we call the posterior lateral branch goes up this way and the posterior descending branch goes this way. So now you can see that uh, bifurcation has been reopened. I don't have too many more of these. I'll be patient. I'm sorry. I know it's dry if you're tired. Um, so this, I think this is an unusual case. 16-year-old male transferred from Club Memorial hosp uh, Hospital with a STEMI. <coughs> so a 16-year-old with a STEMI. Really, just to make you wonder what's going on. Heavy pain and pleuritic pain. Got lytic therapy. I don't think I've ever seen a 16-year-old, uh, except for this patient. Some of that young get lytic therapy. Um, you can see what well, this is the reason they were responding. You have these inferior ST elevations. You don't really see reciprocal changes here. So uh, <coughs> normal coronaries, but he had uh, a rise in troponin, so he did have an infarct technically, and he did have abnormal wall motion. His diagnosis was mild parapoditis. And uh, I don't have examples of this. Marlon and I talked about on the way here. Uh, are you all familiar with the diagnosis of Takasobo cardiomyopathy or stress-induced cardiomyopathy? You've heard that phrase. There's also, um, is that an emergency? No. no. Okay. Um, uh, uh, so um, 
Yeah. Is this is Can I write on this? Yes. So um, this is the normal part, and the heart muscle is contracting like this. Uh, <clears throat> with what uh, at top of sobel cardiomyopathy, uh, you have an apical ballooning phenomenon. So I'm going to exaggerate this a bit. So now you have uh, the, the base of the heart near the valves is contracting normally or even hyperdynamic, and this is not moving at all, the apex of the heart. And they call this Pakusoba, that means Japanese word for octopus trap. So these things look like vases where the octopus crawls in and they get trapped in or can't get out. So that's where the phrase came from. But apical ballooning cardiomyopathy kind of describes it. Uh, and uh, the phrase stress-induced cardiomyopathy is, is also used very um, commonly because uh, this is a, a reaction that can happen in patients who have undergone severe emotional stress. Uh, for example, classically, when this was described, things like uh, loss of a spouse or a child, uh, you know, getting arrested, going to jail, uh, house burning down, kind of things that you, you guys get called for where there's yeah. acute emotional stress. Um, and they can, they can shut down this part of the muscle, and it's not because the vessels are collapsed or are spasmed, you used to think. It's actually a direct adrenaline effect on the myocardium that causes this effect. This almost always goes away two weeks later. Put a patient on a beta blocker, it's normal heart two weeks later. But um, we've seen, uh, this, is, this has become commonly diagnosed now that we are aware of it. In the old days when I was training, we didn't know what these were. We thought they were spasm, we thought the patient was lying, Maybe they had cocaine, maybe they, some other virus did it. And in fact, it's a well-known uh, entity now. And we're, they're reporting that this happens even more commonly in, in situations where you might not be able to get a history of a severe emotional stressful situation. But in these patients, you can have an EKG that looks like a STEMI. I mean, uh, you'll, you'll call it a STEMI. You'll see a big ball of them like this. What you find is it doesn't correspond to the coronary arteries. The coronaries would be normal. And, and the coronaries tend to cross distribution, so the, the area of hypokinesis doesn't map out to one artery or the other. Usually with a heart attack where there was a transient occlusion, vessel closed, reopened, you would see a wall motion abnormality just in the location of that vessel, um, whereas this may cross over vessel boundaries. But we, I saw one of these last week, it was very dramatic. Dupont was only two, but major wall motion abnormality should all get better. I had a, I had a patient like this, a young college student, who was in final exam week and he played saxophone and the, he was a music major. He had to get to performance, he locked his keys in the car and he had a heart attack. And he had the same phenomenon.